I had taken my mother to do an ultrasound scan in one of the hospitals in Greater Accra. And my mother, uh, so this is my mother's account, uh, she came back and then told me that, ah, hello. Uh, so she spoke English, uh, three, but I'll translate it for the sake of our international audience. That, ah, hello. Is that how hospitals uh, behave, or is that how hospitals are supposed to behave? I said, ah, what happened? He said, ah, when I got to the hospital, uh, she had developed uh, malignancy, um, so the abdomen had extended um, a, a, a liver CA. So said, ah, when I got to the hospital, they asked me that I should have drank water. But as I sat there for more than two hours, nobody had told me that I should drink water. And they came to pull me that I should go for the scan. When I entered the room, I was asked whether I had taken water. And I told them, ah, nobody told me I should take water. So I had to come back and then wait for some extra hours having taken the water. And then she goes back in, and the ultrasound scan is done. And she tells me that she was asked to lie down. And she lied, um, according to her, she was almost um, naked. So as she lay down, they were doing the scan. The first person came. She couldn't do a second person. About three, four, five persons came. And then finally, the senior person also comes. And then she does the scan. Uh, it didn't look like anything was seen. So as the senior person was doing it, the senior person is surrounded by a lot of uh, people. So my mother said, ah, hello. So Meko Hospital now the my guinea pig there, and so no me call hospital biomo. This one I had to quote it. Uh, that if she would go to the hospital for her to be used as a guinea pig, then she is not going to go to the hospital again. Um, uh, incidentally, they asked her to come again because they had not seen anything. So for a confirmatory, and she told me Lila, she is never going to step foot in the hospital again. And she had died two years now, and her report is still in that facility. She didn't go for the report. Uh, another incident where, um, again, in another facility, as we visited, we were there, and then a very huge man fell off from his bed. And he fell, and you could hear the sound, brah. As this guy hit the ground, the relatives started shouting, Antines, 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 Antines. And then the nurse turned and looked at the relative and told the relatives, you, you should even be lucky your patient is on admission and has fallen off from the bed. Some other patients we have asked that they go away because we don't have beds available for them. So if you are in and your relative has fallen off from the bed, you should count yourself lucky. So these are, these are a, few, a few patient safety um, incidents. As far as our healthcare setting in the country is concerned, thanks to uh, my boss, uh, Dr. Noti, a lot of the issues have been captured. So wherever there seem to be uh, some semblance, I would, um, I would skip them. This is what um, Jen Bosco says, the WHO, the Afro. He says that there is no quality without safety, and no safety without quality. Safety is at a virgin state in most African countries, including Ghana. And it is difficult to prioritize patient safety, patient safety actions, unless it is explained in terms of how it contributes to systems strengthening. So quality of care, at this, this have been said. So whether, so quality of care is this. Uh, Dr. Noti again has mentioned this already in his presentation. So where there are similarities, in, and he mentioned this that there are six dimensions of healthcare quality as far as the IOM is is concerned. Uh, so safety is an integral part, and for the purpose of this meeting, I am talking about patient safety. So this is what Hippocrates says. Hippocrates says that he will do no harm. For now, as far as our practice is concerned, this saying by Hippocrates has been 
changed. And we say that I will first do no harm. Active processes of evaluating and reducing harm. It is also about learning how to improve safety and patient satisfaction despite harm in the wider healthcare systems and context. So in the story that I gave of my mother, it is about patient satisfaction. It is the management of risk over time in order to maximize the benefit and minimize harm as much as possible to patients in healthcare systems. Patient safety is the absence of preventable harm to a patient during the process of healthcare. This process is active. I mean, it is very deliberate. It is very explicit and conscious. And it is intentional. And it is scientific. It is not haphazard. The process is cross-cutting. The entire system of the health system is affected. So it is, I mentioned that it is scientific. And it is about evaluating. So we evaluate. And then we ensure that we are reducing preventable harm. And more importantly, we are learning how to improve upon the safety in the wider healthcare system, as I mentioned. It is a fully inclusive process. So we cannot ensure patient safety without all the stakeholders as far as the healthcare provision is concerned. It refers to all the processes and structures which, when applied, reduces the probability of adverse events. I'll talk about adverse events shortly. So today, Patient safety is defined as this, according to Vicent, that it is the avoidance, prevention, and amelioration of adverse outcomes or injuries. That stems from the process of healthcare. So the emphasis is healthcare. So the patient comes, and then during his or her encounter with healthcare, something untoward happens, or the patient is harmed. So what is our business in healthcare? I mean, it is a given that as healthcare, we should ensure prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases. But our business in healthcare is to work and to improve it. More importantly, our business in healthcare is safety and keeping people safe. The patient safety journey, uh, 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 Roland is gone. Uh, he gave some trajectory of where we have come from from 1995 with the publication, uh, with the Harvard Medical Practice. This study was the largest study that was done, and it was one of the epoch studies as far as the journey in patient safety was concerned. It was undertaken by Brennan and his colleagues, LEAP. And for them, the findings that they, they, they identified was is what others are also mimicking with so many other uh, appropriate uh, study designs. Uh, we have also seen in 2004 where we have had the World Alliance of Patient Safety. This was also led by Liam Donaldson. And then in 2005 where we had a Global Safety Challenge. More importantly, in 2002, our world leaders saw it very important. So it was one of the agenda as far as the World Health Assembly at the time was concerned. For us in 2008 in Africa, the fever caught up with our leaders also in Africa. So in between 2005 and 2009, something happened in the UK, the mid Staffordshire. Those of us in the patient safety uh, uh, fraternity and the quality world would know. In the mid Staffordshire, an inquiry was done by uh, Francis. So we have the Francis report. And these are some of the findings that they saw in the UK at the time, that patients were left in their excrement in soil bed clothes for lengthy periods. And then assistance was not provided to the patient with feeding when they called for help. In spite of persistent requests for help, patients were not assisted in their toileting. Wards and toilet facilities were left in very filthy conditions. Privacy and dignity, even in death, were denied these patients. Triage in accident and emergency was undertaken by untrained staff. And then members of staff treated patients and those close to them with what appeared to be callous indifference in the narratives that I gave. Uh, but uh, the question I ask is, uh, this was way back 2005, 2009. In our setting in Ghana, do we see semblances of some of these in our setting in Ghana? 
Uh, some of the statistics have been given by the earlier presenters, but what I want to add is that healthcare is not safe, and this is not what Elom is saying. This is what all the publications in the patient safety literature is concerned, that when you go to the hospital, there is a one in 10 probability that you are going to be harmed. So you are safer. It is more safe flying than going to the hospital. Because for all of us here, I don't know our count, but if we are assuming we are 5, 10, 100, you will find 1% of us whenever we go to the hospital, we are going to be harmed. But so you are more safer doing more than 900 travels of air, air flight than visiting the hospital even two, three, or five times in a year. So healthcare is not safe. Some of the uh, statistics have been provided already, so I would not want to bore you with, with them. But more importantly, a lot of the adverse events are preventable. So they are, I mean, they are preventable. And this is a study that was done by Wilson, 83 good percent of the adverse events or the patient safety events that were identified were deemed to be preventable. And 30% of these were associated with death. Again, these are the error types. We have therapeutic, diagnostic, and operative errors. And again, if we look at the burden as far as health, healthcare-associated infections is concerned, for us in developing countries, we don't even have statistics as far as what the burden is. So in every literature, this is almost the conclusions that you will be finding, that the burden of healthcare-associated infections in developing countries is high. When we look at the cost, Dr. Note gave us some of the costs, but these are also some other costs that were gleaned. And this is a study done by David Bates. David Bates also found out that the total cost for patient safety events or adverse events, this is adverse drug events, increased by 3,244 3, as far as adverse drug events were concerned. And the length of stays of the patient also increases. For the global burden, as far as the burden again is concerned, we look at this um, conclusion by these authors. And they are telling us that using a conservative approach, it is estimated that there are at least 43 million injuries each year due to medical care, and that nearly 23 million disability-adjusted life years are lost as a consequence of adverse events or patient safety events. What is the situation in Ghana? In Ghana, unfortunately, we don't have any, or I didn't see any published literature as far as I was certain on the, on the incidence and prevalence in the country was concerned. But I want to share this with you. Um, sometime about two or three years ago, we support the Ministry of Health took steps to develop a national patient safety policy. So this exercise had to be carried out. The WHO long form, the patient safety situational assessment form was used. And then we assessed uh, a, a number of hospitals in the country, including a number of the teaching hospitals. This is a cumulative findings. So in the patient safety action area from the WHO, there are 12 action areas of patient safety. And they go on and on from national patient safety policy, knowledge in patient safety, patient safety uh, awareness, uh, healthcare associated infections, issues with health workers. So uh, uh, Dr. Abugri, your question on where, uh, the emphasis on the patient other than health workers, when we are very holistic and comprehensive as far as our approach to patient safety is concerned, every variable uh, in the healthcare setting would be adequately taken care of. So this was, uh, this was the, the findings, and we saw we were not doing too well as far as healthcare-associated infections, surgical uh, safety, issues of medication safety, and then patient safety surveillance and patient safety finding, uh, funding were, were concerned. This is for uh, the national uh, picture. When we look at hand hygiene, uh, again, or issues of infection prevention and control, hospital-acquired infections. There are still in some, faci some facilities, infection prevention and control is suboptimal. When we look at medication safety, I mean, we are 
still doing something as far as these are concerned. I mean, the Food and Drugs Authority is one of the few agencies in the country that is using uh, electronic reporting of adverse drug events. So they are collating the data real time, except that we don't have any national repository as far as adverse event or incident reporting is concerned. This uh, gentleman, Wyos, I believe those of us in Ghana know him. And he had his six months old daughter die from a drug overdose. And at a point, there was also this report of a frustrated father who had threatened to kill authorities at a certain, at one of the hospitals in Greater Accra after he lost his or her five year old daughter. Surgical safety, again, I picked this also from the literature. And in our own Kolebu Teaching Hospital, um, there was a surgery uh, that was done. Uh, this is for a 37 year old son. It says that um, Agnes Otu cried for an entire mouth, for an entire, entire month when her 37 year old son passed away. He underwent a routine operation to repair a small hole in his heart on August 17, 2010 at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital in Accra, but Otu never ended up leaving the hospital. Another thing about surgical safety also has to do with this other uh, study. This was also done by Dr. Dakubu uh, and one of, his, uh, one of his colleagues also in the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, where uh, gauze uh, were removed from uh, surgeries that was done. I mean, they had, they, these were cases of about 12 cases, and they removed gauze and other surgical items uh, from, uh, from a, couple of the, a couple of the patients. I, adverse events had been talked about, so, but key in adverse events is that it results in this temporary or permanent disability. It is life-threatening. And it is caused by healthcare management other than the patient's own underlying conditions. So it is an injury that is not due to the underlying disease condition, but results from the medical intervention. So for all the pictures and all the narratives that I had given, they, were, they could all be classified as adverse events. And these are some of the uh, types of adverse events that, that we could see. But interestingly, uh, this, all we are seeing are even just the tip of the iceberg because a lot of the problems, a lot of the issues are even not reported. A lot of the staffs do not even get to the attention of the authorities. So, I mean, if one out of ten people are dying, if that is the tip of the iceberg, then if we enter deep down the sea to look at the iceberg, your guess is as good as mine what the true incidences would be. But what are the causes? Poor leadership and governance in our healthcare institutions is one. I mean, and there is also inadequate assessment of staff satisfaction. Oftentimes, there is unacceptable delay in addressing the issue of shortage of staff, especially nursing staff in our healthcare institutions. I mean, in uh, one uh, study that I read, and which has convinced me is that if nurses take up their leadership role as far as our healthcare institutions are concerned, I mean, 90% of the patient safety events would be arrested. I mean, this is accepted uh, all over, that nurses would have to play a critical role as far as advancing the safety of our patient is concerned. And the needless shortages would have to be addressed if we would want to do something about patient safety. And there is inadequate standards and performance as far as our setting is concerned. Where the standards are available, health workers do not adhere to those standards and protocols in our hospitals. And there is often wrong priorities. Sometimes you sit in hospital performance reviews and you wonder whether you are in a financial uh, institution. All the emphasis is about money, profit, how much are we making? Bottom line, money, 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 money. It is not how, what is our mortality rate? What is our crude mortality rate? How many patients are dying? What are we, 
I mean, it is all about money, 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 money. And it is wrong priorities as far as our settings are concerned. And we call something human factors. Human factors has to do with fitting the person to the system so that we ensure that whatever technology or whatever the person is working with, the health worker is very comfortable and he or she is able to deliver. But unfortunately, most of our tasks, most of our processes and most of our systems are very difficult that it makes it impossible for any rational human being to make a mistake. Communication has been talked about. There are often inadequate logistics. So health workers are asked to improvise. I mean, and improvise for how long? Patients are not heard. Where they are heard, they are not listened to. And the classical example was my mother's case. There have been so many instances where patients have not been heard, patients have not been listened to. Who are you to tell me what to do? When I was studying medicine, when I was studying nursing, where were you? So I mean, we see our patients as empty and not knowing anything. So this, so it is what the doctors tell the patients or what the healthcare workers are telling the patients. That is it. So they take it as gospel. And there is often professional disengagement. Most often we health workers are disengaged from what the issues are. Dr. Norte was heavy on patient safety culture, so I would not want to belabor the point. Interestingly, these courses are also courses that was identified by the Francis report as far as the mid Staffordshire inquiry was concerned. This was happening in the UK way back in the 2005. And you would see this in our settings today in 2017. What are the implications? This is one, that a woman who was delivered of a baby through caesarean section at the 37 military hospital has sued the hospital for professional negligence, saying a doctor left a surgical needle in her stomach after the operation. So the legal implications are plenty. This is another suit against the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. This was picked in 2006, that the boy who sued the Kolebu Teaching Hospital for negligence told the Fast Track High Court hearing hearing the case yesterday that there was nothing wrong with his left leg when it was operated upon by the hospital. I now have pains in my left leg, which was wrongly operated upon and cannot play football anymore. This uh, patient had the wrong leg operated. So he left the theater bed with the wrong leg intact and the right leg was cut. This is another implication as far as our setting was concerned. This is a young baby who had a cannula left in her artery after, uh, after an infusion. And our own popular Suweba case, where this happened in another teaching hospital in the country, the Confanoche Teaching Hospital, where a baby was missing. I mean, a stillbirth. Normally, stillbirths are even not are nothing. They go unannounced until Suebes incidents happen. As far as the implications for patient safety are concerned, they are numerous, both internally and even externally. So elsewhere, Medicare, this is in the US, where Medicare is cutting patients to 700, cutting payments to 721 hospitals with highest rates of infections and injuries. This, this is in 2014. And in another publication, this is in 2016, 769 hospitals see Medicare payments cut over high rates, seven, over high rates of hospital acquired infections. So these are so the implications, the legal, the financial, and even the discomfort to their family and friends, and all the others that we know are very dire. I mean, but this could have gone unnoticed as far as our setting is concerned. So the question then is how can we make healthcare safe? Dr. Note has mentioned the patient safety goal, so I would also not want to talk about it. But I believe that every healthcare institution in the country would have to adopt these healthcare goals. Because for all the narratives that I have mentioned, they are as a result of the absence of one 
or more of these goals in the healthcare settings. The other approach has to do with leadership and commitment. I mean, we would have to see leadership at every level as far as the health system is concerned. Awareness creation for healthcare workers as we are having here is also key. And we would have to review and simplify our processes. Sometimes it is just so difficult and so tedious for healthcare workers to follow a new procedure or a new protocol. We would have to be as simple as possible. Recently I was with one medical director and he was telling me, hello, you guys, you guys have introduced new forms for data collection. Have you seen, do you know the implication of what you have introduced? The, the, the variables you are looking for is so complex that the health worker is already filling NHIS form, filling A and D forms and all that, and then you are adding this you would have to ensure some level of integration and simplification of the processes. That is what would make the frontliners do what we want them to do. For me, in my work, one of the uh, phrases I have come to love so far is that uh, change is exciting if it is being done by you, but it is very furious and annoying when it is done to you. So, I mean, depending on who is bringing the change, and then the attitude. So we would have to be mindful of the recipients of the changes we try to introduce. And making things visible. I've talked about standardization. And then avoiding reliance on memories. I mean, sometimes, so in a typical uh, Ghanaian setting, there is, everything is in the memory of the healthcare worker. <laughs> I mean, everything is in the memory of the healthcare worker. That's, but when you travel elsewhere, there are protocols, even how to open doors. There are protocols on how to open doors. And we have to, Dr. Note has also mentioned this, the need to improve upon communication and teamwork. I talked about um, the human factor. So this is some uh, assessment that we, we, can be, we can be doing as healthcare workers. Uh, because I am not doing... Uh, human factors we can ignore. But another important thing is about forcing functions. The forcing functions is ensuring that it prevents an unintended or undesirable action from being performed. So that the aircraft industry realizes that until, they, until that crazy man who dived and crashed that airline, they thought that when there are two co-pilots in an airline, and one person goes out, the other person would be sane enough to ensure that the pilot cruises to its destination. Until this insane, please allow my use of the word insane, but that was the description as far as the, uh, as far as the investigation by the airline industry was concerned. That this guy locks up his colleague out of the cockpit and then crashes the airline alone, and everybody on board that aircraft dies. Since then, the aviation industry revises, and they make it possible for a co-pilot who steps out to be able to enter the cockpit. And that is forcing function. Or in our setting, those of you who drive luxury cars, if you drive automatic car, if the car is at D, it is impossible to remove the key. And sometimes, if you drive the American cars, immediately you start your car, your lights are on. So these are forcing functions. So it ensures that it makes it impossible for the user to make a mistake. And that should be the design as far as our health settings are concerned. So that, I mean, when you mix uh, plenty medications and there is an emergency, the likelihood that the nurse would not pick the wrong medication is very slim. So I talk about this. One of the things that are being used, especially avoiding over-reliance on memory, is the checklist, the WHO checklist. And this Atul Gawan and his colleagues developed this checklist. And it was used in one setting. And they saw that the checklist, with the use of the checklist, they were able to reduce complications 
from 11% to 7%, and this was statistically significant. For surgical site infections, the use of the WHO checklist was able to reduce surgical site infections from 62% also to 3.4%. Uh, and this is Peter Pronovost. They use a simple bundle, hand washing, cleaning the skin with chlorhexidine, removing unnecessary catheters, using full barrier precautions, and av avoiding femoral site. With this simple bundle, they were able to go 52 weeks in their department without one uh, central line associated bloodstream infections. Most often in our settings, we are interested in punishing people whenever offenses happen. So it is about punishment. So, I mean, we feel that you cannot make a mistake. How can you go to medical school and make a mistake? It is a no-no. Or how can you study nursing and make a mistake? So when they occur, the victims are punished. In another setting, we believe that, so that the perfectionist uh, thinking is that it is impossible for healthcare personnel to make a mistake. So when you make a mistake, I mean, you will, you will even be ostracized by your colleagues. So the greatest impediment as far as error prevention and patient safety is concerned is that we punish people for making mistakes instead of investigating. So are we at the crossroads? I picked this from Dr. Soji Soji Tete's blog. He says that Sue Ebe's case, it will keep on happening till it dawns on us that singling out one or two junior frontline staff for punitive action will not address this canker unless there is a systematic change of a fundamental nature which is made. In a sense, so that is, that is it, I will not bore you with. But recently there was also another news of a missing baby. And immediately the news came that the baby had been found. <laughs> Safety should be part and parcel of everything we do. Every decision that is made, whether it is administrative, budgetary, or otherwise, should, we should take safety implications into account because there is such an important business case for doing so. What we have right now, quite frankly, in healthcare are islands. And these are visible islands of excellence in a sea of invisible failures with risk which continue to lack below the waterline. What do we need to do? We have to connect these islands with more dry land. We need to widen the islands of excellence. We need to address the areas of risk. And more importantly, it is going to require transparency. It is going to require data, robust data collection. And it's also going to require personal storytelling. It is also going to require effective use of information technology. This is by, he is an airline captain. So to conclude, I've already mentioned that patient safety is a system-wide issue other than an individual issue. It is a responsibility of all of us, healthcare workers and patients inclusive. And we need to practice and learn from patient safety experiences so that we are able to improve upon the delivery of care. My colleague, made reference to Albert Einstein. And I love Albert Einstein because insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. Otherwise, this is what we are going to see. When the police, when the Facebooking and the media, when we do not heed to the call of the patients, very soon they are going to come to us in the hospitals and in our consulting rooms with guns pointing at us to ensure that we do the right things. Thank you very much. I, would, I acknowledge these people. They have been very instrumental as far as my professional journey and work uh, is, is concerned. These are some references that you can find. So, thank you. in a hospital boardroom somewhere in America.
the case of Whitney Ross. What went wrong? In a way, I think we all wish that the result of her case had been related to her appendicitis. But it wasn't. So what went wrong? And what can we do to fix it? Whitney was a sophomore in college, an excellent student with dreams and goals. She came to be in post-op after having an appendectomy. Still doing a little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this IV line still really hurts. Well, like I said, I can try moving it to the other arm. Yeah, whatever you could do. Sure. Is that a rash? Oh, my cat scratched me a few days ago. I told them when they took my history. Okay. It shouldn't be a problem if the IV is down by the wrist. Thanks. Sorry to be such a bother. I'll be back in just a minute. Okay. The probable source of the infection was down the hall. Tom wasn't even supposed to still be there, but he contracted a MRSA infection at his surgical site. His daughter, Kelly, unfortunately didn't understand that even though she was just a visitor, she was also a part of the healthcare team. Hey, uh, my dad could use an extra pillow for his back. Okay, I'll bring you one in just a second. Kelly had been educated by a nurse about the barrier precautions and the dangers of healthcare associated infections, but she didn't quite grasp how just one lapse can cause infection to spread. Dina, she was a good nurse, but was burned out with stresses at work and home. I know you're always busy with all the paperwork you're doing, but if you could get to us soon. She wasn't going the extra mile to ensure the safety of patients. I just need another minute or two, and then I will bring you a pillow, yes. Okay, thanks. She recognized Kelly wasn't using the gloves correctly, but didn't use the opportunity to educate and didn't take personal responsibility for cleaning a potentially contaminated surface. Uh, Whitney's IV still hurts. I'm going to try moving it to the other arm. Can you cover Mr. Daniels for a few minutes? Yeah, I wasn't going to finish this anyway. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Nathan, he was the director of the post-op unit. He'd come back from a conference on patient safety and infection control, motivated to make a difference. But he never instituted a sustained effort. Real change never happened. So an otherwise responsible new nurse just out of school never got the message. She was using gloves so she didn't also feel the need to wash her hands. Nathan's staff did everything right when he was around. But there was no sense of ownership, no real change. There wasn't 100% commitment. Oh, that's so much better. Thank you. Let me know if there's anything else you need. Okay. Um, straight A's this semester and a million dollars. <laughs> Okay, set your sights a little lower, just buzz. <laughs> the infection preventionist working with post-op was Janice. Janice couldn't successfully implement a team approach to infection prevention. Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Why? What's wrong? She was always considered an outsider. Nothing's wrong. I just wanted to follow up with you on some ideas. She lacked the skills to successfully coach staff members, and so everyone's awareness of healthcare-associated infection suffered as a result. Is it cold in here? I don't think so. But I can get you another blanket. Okay. The nurse made a note in a chart, but didn't alert anyone until after shift change. Temperature is 101, blood pressure 145 over 97, nothing moving in her GI tract, hypoactive bowel sounds. Looks like it's ileus. Hmm. Guess you stand another day. Yeah. Let's see what Dr. Kennedy says. Thanks. And well, in his third year of med school, he longed to make a difference. A temp of 101 is fairly typical for appendicitis. Let's monitor the post-operative ileus for 24 hours. But the patient got worse. She's been acting a little confused, but her temperature went back down. What concerns me is her arm. Look. Manuel had been watching the case all day. He suspected the patient's condition was getting much worse. I saw that. But it's here in her history. Her cat scratched her arm and she got a rash. Did you read her history, Manuel? Let's stick Dr. With the Kennedy directed the team to continue the antibiotics already prescribed for her appendectomy and closely monitor her condition. Monitor for peritonitis. I'm on call this weekend. Alert me if she doesn't respond. But Manuel's rotation and post-op was almost over and he didn't want to stick his neck out. Manuel accepted the attending's course of action without objection. When it came time to make a difference, he didn't speak up, even though the problem was staring him in the face. 48 hours later, the nursing assistant took Whitney's vitals at shift change, including a temperature of 97 and blood pressure of 90 over 60. But Manuel just recorded it and never related to the nurse or bothered Dr. Kennedy because it was the weekend. It was a chain of events that should not have happened. By the time she reached the ICU, she was suffering from organ failure as a result of sepsis. And then... Hey, Dr. Green. Um, everyone. The ICU just called me. Whitney from 204, she had a MRSA infection in her bloodstream. She passed away. 
I'll be around to talk with everyone, but... Any one of several individuals could have made a better decision. And Whitney might be alive today. She came in with appendicitis. But everyone knew that a patient had just died from poor infection prevention and poor communication. What's wrong? What could they say? They said what had too often been said. Nothing. Um, how can I help you? No, my dad is asking about... What happened? Whitney joined countless others who have died of an infection acquired during their care. But you know what? It doesn't have to be like this. This is not reality. You have a second chance to go back in time and make new decisions as five of these characters. See if you can make choices that will change their approach to healthcare associated infections and prevent this outcome. Get it? This is you. This is you. This is you. This is you. And this is you. Go back in time and make better decisions so that this is you. Doctor said I healed up fast. And not this. Take a walk in their shoes. If you're smart, we can improve quality of care and save patient lives. Please to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kenny Yang. Dr. Kenny Yang, he owns double PhD, double doctors. One is MD, the other is PhD in traditional medicine. Actually, he is also a Taiwanese Canadian because for the past 10 years, every year he visit to Ghana <laughs> and stay here. So uh, let's welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Yang. Give us a talk on the integrated care for better quality improvement. Okay, sure. and uh, here there is a, uh, we are in here, right? And uh, do you know where is the Taiwan? <laughs> <laughs> here, you see, there is a small island, and uh, it's a long distance from Taiwan to uh, Ghana. Okay, and uh, I will also give you a brief introduction about the the, the profile of the Taiwan. Taiwan population is uh, 22, uh, 23 million. It's a, a similar but less than uh, Ghana's population, right? But our land area just uh, uh, 60, 36 uh, square kilometer. It's a uh, in Ghana, maybe around 238, so more than uh, six times than Taiwan. But the population is similar. And uh, by the way, in Taiwan, the most uh, we have a high mountain, so we don't have uh, enough space to use. So we also lack some uh, natural resource. So in this uh, small area, we created some the. Uh, special uh, medical the skill and the, some equipment. And the, our aging over 85 is 12.5%. Uh, uh, and 12.5% uh, uh, per, uh, and the GDP per capita is uh, over uh, 22,000 US dollar. And the life expectancy on uh, uh, 2014 the female is uh, 83.2, and the male is uh, uh, 76.7. Okay, sorry. Can you? Okay. By the way, Taiwan is a, a major island. We call it Taiwan, and some associated small island, just sim similar to the. Uh, 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 mm. Okay, sorry. I just <laughs> forget the, the, the nature name. Okay, so Taiwan, we call the Republic of China. There is ROC, there is uh, including the island and the, the associated island. But uh, the major one is uh, Taiwan. So sometimes they call Taiwan is uh, majorly the island and they have uh, some associated island. Okay, uh, integrative medicine, they have many different definitions around the world, right? 
but uh, the main purpose is uh, try to try to provide a patient-centered care and increase medical quality. But uh, from the narrow view, we can find it's a interdisciplinary cooperation in the conventional medical system. The interdisciplinary is different from the multidisciplinary. For example, if you just uh, cook a soup, you cannot cook every material, then just put in hot water, right? So the interdisciplinary cooperation is a very important. They put it together, then cook. So interdisciplinary cooperation is the most component is the communicate between the doctor. So sometimes we just think for the medical quality. We ask patient, maybe you should seek a secondary opinion. But if you are a patient, how can you make a decision? For example, you have a goit, you have a thyroid problem. You go to see a general surgeon. Maybe he will ask you, "Oh, it's just a small operation. It's okay, right?" But if you go to see a metabolic doctor, you just, "Oh, it's a, we give you some the the oral hypoglycemic agent. It's okay, right?" But if the patient get a second opinion. How can you make a decision? So the most important is uh, maybe sometimes is uh, communicate, even talk between the doctor is uh, very important. And uh, they are in the uh, simple cases, it's okay. But some in the uh, complicated cases, they are uh, very very important. So from the narrow viewpoint, we can see there is uh, interdisciplinary cooperation in the conventional medical system in the uh, Western medicine medical system. But uh, from a general perspective, it seeks a new model to combine uh, conventional medicine and uh, complementary and uh, alternative medicine, we call it CAM. But the most important is uh, based on the uh, evidence supporting. That is uh, very important because uh, we can see the uh, evidence-based concept is uh, a bridge to communicate the uh, complementary and the alternative medicine and the Western medicine. So the concept is uh, we combine with a uh, complementary CAM and the uh, EBM, we call it EBCM, evidence-based complementary and the alternative medicine. That is uh, very important. If you want to do the uh, integrated uh, in a different kind of uh, uh, method to treat patient. So as we know, there is a uh, Evidence pyramid. Every pyramid, uh, they, they the different uh, evidence base. They the they the weak evidence base, and uh, from here to the top, uh, they the strong evidence, right? But uh, you know, in the complementary and alternative medicine, we just think the lack of the strong evidence base. Why? Because uh, they not uh, the the major medical system. So sometimes if they want to do some study, maybe they lack of the budget, right? And even they have a different concept, so they also have a different study design, not just similar to the Western medicine. So from the pyramid, even we find something in the uh, individual study, and even some the expert opinion, they also belong to one kind of one kind of evidence, but it's uh, more weak. So if we want to get uh, some the strong evidence base, maybe we will do more to uh, some study and uh, to find uh, the evidence base to support. So sometimes the uh, evidence base is not uh, the only concept, because uh, the evidence based medicine is uh, combined with the best research evidence. The best research is from not a data bank you can find. And uh, they also have the clinical appetite, your experience, they are very important. But uh, don't forget the patient value. Because uh, EBM is the begins and ends with patients. For example, patients suffer from, uh, they are the ones I made the patients suffer from PPI. In the Western medicine, you must receive an operation, right? P 
DPI and must receive operation, but uh, because the patient is uh, old, uh, age more than 80 years old, and uh, his uh, son decided to don't receive the operation treatment. <coughs> so what can you do? So in this uh, situation, we just select to the conservative treatment, right? You maintain antibiotics and uh, maintain to keep the vital signs stable. Finally, the patient survived. So don't forget we have the best uh, evidence base. You have a very uh, strong your uh, experience, but don't forget the patient value is very important. So when I share the experience in Taiwan, maybe we cannot match the, the experience in the Ghana, but uh, actually we hope I can give you a, a big concept, the global concept to think about the integrated medicine. So the integrated medicine is the EBGM plus the conventional medicine. That is why I want to talk. So we know that the uh, integrated medicine, the conventional is the Western medicine, and the complementary and the alternative medicine in Taiwan, majorly is the traditional Chinese medicine. Because in the different country, they have a different major complementary and alternative medicine. For example, in Europe, maybe homeopathy, maybe the major, major component of the complementary and the alternative medicine. But in Taiwan, the, the traditional Chinese medicine is uh, the major one. And uh, the, there are three major methods to treat a patient. We use the uh, medicinal formula. They use the uh, uh, traditional Chinese herb. Maybe you make it become the liquid form or powder form or even pure form and uh, so many kind of the form. And the acupuncture, not just use the needle. Sometimes we use uh, some the herb to roll just like a cigar and uh, to have the heat to stimulate acupoint. And uh, even you have a cupping, just a, uh, they the, uh, they the some racing, you can see they the aesthetic have a cupping, cupping imprint in the body. The cupping may be the broad concept of the acupoint because you select some the uh, acupoint to do the stimuli and uh, even the, the muscle strain therapies. They just are similar to the, the chiropractic in the different country. So in the traditional Chinese medicine, the, we majorly have the three uh, methods to treat the patient. But from the beginning, uh, we need to go back to review the history of the insurance system in Taiwan. In the 1950, they first the labor insurance. They just uh, cover some uh, uh, labor medical problem. And uh, in the 1958, they the government employee insurance. For example, we are in a public hospital. We belong to the government employee insurance. And uh, in the 1985, they have the farmers insurance. The farmers insurance not just cover farmers; they also include the fishermen and uh, some the some the labor not included in the insurance. And in the 1995, we have uh, another new system of national health insurance. Because of why we have uh, this insurance? Because before that. We totally have a certain kind of a insurance system, but it's cover totally only 59% of the population. And the, the majorly, the most of the uninsured were the children and the elderly. So while we development the national health insurance, we try to cover most of our population. So when we uh, review the historical insurance system, and uh, we also need to know the Chinese medicine in Taiwan. In the, uh, from the labor insurance system, the development in the 1950, but uh, till the 1975, the first time they covered uh, China, Chinese medicine. They passed uh, 20, more than 20 years. And uh, the, from the beginning, just covered uh, bone fracture or dislocation. They included uh, in the initial coverage of the labor medical insurance, they found the beginning. 
Then in the 1983, and the, the therapeutic item was expanded to uh, internal medicine and the gynecology and the acupuncture. And the, the most important, the system can become uh, successful. That is the most important is the, the provider. Because uh, the totally 93% uh, of the healthcare provider contract with the national health insurance. So if you just uh, have a contract with a, a hospital, you don't contract with a, a private clinic, the, your population, your people will think it's uh, not convenient to get uh, health insurance, uh, the, to get uh, health, medical help. And uh, nowadays, uh, most uh, we also think about uh, some disadvantage. They have uh, some privilege. Even they can don't have uh, enough money to pay, and uh, the common use uh, some uh, finance to cover it. So the benefit, including the disease and the injury, even uh, maternity care, and uh, in the uh, uh, reimburse, you can see the traditional Chinese medicine also include in the national health insurance system. So we can review the expenditure in the national health insurance system in Taiwan. The 2015, the, the Western medicine the expenditure is the uh, 500 billion NT dollars. It's uh, just uh, similar to the uh, 71 billion Ghana cities. And uh, in the uh, Chinese medicine, you can see uh, there is uh, 22 billion NT dollars is uh, around uh, the 3 billion Ghana cities. So the utility in the uh, Chinese medicine around uh, the nearly 30%, but you see there is a the expenditure is very, very low. Because uh, in the Western medicine, there are so many items that are so expensive. And in the traditional medicine, it's more cheaper, right? So there is another concept you can, you can think. And because, uh, according, because we are a single payer system, single payer national health insurance program system, and uh, we have more than 23 million data bank, right? So uh, under this uh, situation, we, uh, the National Health Insurance Research Database was established by the Corporation of National Health Insurance, Research Insurance, NHRI, and the National Health Administration. And uh, because it from the, uh, the big data, the data bank, and uh, they extract they use a statistic method to extract one million data. One million data to become, it can represent equal to the uh, local population. So it, the one million database is a very, very big data. You can find anything you want. You can uh, write it, uh, uh, it's a correlation. And uh, this dat database is uh, uh, anonymous. Identify for the patients, the hospital, clinic, and the physician providing the service. So it's forming the largest such a collection in the world. So after the, the database, so we can find so many the evidence based about the integrated medicine. So the database include the national health insurance claim data and the fund enrollment and the provider file. In addition to the birthday, gender of each patient, the national health insurance claim data also record the diagnosis data of, data of the serv service and the drug prescribed and so on. So you see there is so many data in the data bank. So you can extract and the, the do the analysis. So there uh, are so many papers already published based on the National Health Insurance Research data, Database. So I just uh, share with you some already published the, the study. Because uh, some study is based on the integrated medicine concept to do an analysis. So there is a retrospective core study compare Comparing stroke recurrence rate in ischemic stroke patients with or uh, without acupuncture treatment. 
the patient saw from the ischemic stroke, he, he easily more easier to get a re stroke, right? So we just uh, to do some patient receive acupuncture treatment and uh, some patient don't receive acupuncture treatment, and uh, we use the data bank, and uh, we can know the result. There are totally uh, more than 30,000 30, patient new diagnosis cases. It's came in the year 2000 to 2004 was included. And the follow-up period from the 2000 to the 2009. And uh, we use the uh, uh, heart ratio and the uh, cost proportional heart model to analyze this. And the result we can see, they the uh, stroke-free the curve the uh, receiver acupuncture, the stroke-free curve, is uh, better than the, the non-acupuncture. So we can see, because uh, before that, we, we had to do the, uh, to get the evidence-based about the uh, integrative medicine, about the complementary and alternative medicine. But uh, from the data bank, we can easier to find some the integrative result. So the, the, th the paper conclusion is to reveal the uh, possibility that the acupuncture might be effective in lowering stroke recurrence rate, even in those on um, medication for uh, stroke prevention. They also highlight that patients sometimes receive uh, anticoagulant, antiplatelet, even the uh, steroid, even the lipid lowering agent. They also see the difference. So I think that uh, about this uh, data, we can know that is uh, helpful for patients. And uh, there another one is uh, the select patient is a traumatic brain injury. Also, the traumatic brain injury is easier to get a stroke, and they also analyze the acupuncture. There are totally the, uh, 7,000 patients uh, receive acupuncture treatment, and uh, they have uh, some uh, propensity score match the TBI. They, uh, made uh, 29,000 patients in the uh, year 2000 to year 2008, and the follow till the end of uh, uh, 20, 2010, and they use a similar uh, heart ratio and the uh, cost proportional heart model. We also can see that the stroke-free proportion, they uh, receive the uh, acupuncture in the follow to the 10 years, and the they the uh, non-acupuncture use. You can see they the, uh, uh, effective to decrease uh, the stroke rate. So you can see that the show decrease the uh, risk of uh, stroke compared with uh, uh, without acupuncture treatment. But sometimes uh, this data also have uh, some limitation. Okay, but uh, at least uh, we find something we cannot find before, right? And uh, mostly every. Most of our people may be saying that the acupuncture is more easier to, to do a study. But we also use this data bank to analyze the objective traditional Chinese medicine therapy, improve survival of liver cancer patients, use traditional Chinese medicine. And they are from the year 2000 to 2009, they are totally the 120. 7,000 new diagnosis liver cancer patient and the follow here 2011 use a heart ratio and the heart ratio is found you can decrease you can uh, decrease the mortality rate uh, either reach to the 35 percent and the uh, 90, 95 competence interval is uh, real point six four and uh, to real point six six. So another interesting is uh, they just uh, according to a mortality of liver cancer, they just uh, uh, stratified by the different causes of the liver cancer problem. Maybe they according to a liver cirrhosis are called holic liver damage, or even now a holic fatty liver disease, hepa hepatitis B or hepatitis C. We can see the heart ratio all decreased. So we can see uh, the conclusion that TCM may improve the survival in the liver cancer patient. And the similar significant protective effect of the uh, traditional Chinese medicine use, also cross variant subgroup is also useful. So according to the drama, why patients want to choose the CAM? Because uh, they dissatisfy the conventional medical care. 
because we, we know the conventional medical system, they have some limitation. So we try to integrate different methods to enhance the, the success rate. And uh, the patients seem to see more effective way to improve their health and their well-being. And sometimes if uh, you receive some treatment, the drug have the side effect. They try to use uh, this chem to relieve the symptom associated with the uh, side effect. For example, when patients receive a chemotherapy, the ED is to suffer from nausea, vomiting, and uh, weakness, fatigue. Now there is uh, one uh, fatigue injection in the uh, Western medicine uh, to treat uh, the uh, cancer fatigue syndrome. But uh, the major is extracted from the traditional Chinese medicine. And uh, they also want to decrease the side effect of conventional medicine treatment. Okay, the final two, take home message. Integrated medicine is uh, most important is uh, we try to do use uh, evidence-based medicine to be a bridge to connect uh, conventional medicine and uh, complementary and alternative medicine. That is uh, very important. Because uh, even you have a case report, but if you can have a more strong evidence-based, you, you, you can know how to use it in the patient. The most important is the patient-centered care. Because uh, in our medical quality, we just uh, talk about patient-centered, patient-centered. But actually, sometimes, most of, most of the times, they're physician-centered, right? Because if you suffer from the cancer, you just ask your patient don't receive any other medicine, just use Western medicine. But uh, if you, you are very close relative gut cancer, sometimes you will try to find some method to help the result, right? So the patient-centered care is a very, very important. You must uh, make sure not uh, the physician-centered. And uh, the last is just remember, nothing can be everything, but everything can be something. <laughs> Thank you. much uh, both of you for a very very interesting uh, talks um, Elon well done for continuing what you started it's extremely good you know this issue of patient centeredness is what we in our training of medical students have taken on board as heart power because that is what is missing in the care of our patients. We've forgotten how to put the patient first. Part of what that entails is that we need, as health professionals, to do a lot of introspection, to look into ourselves, and to examine our actions more critically when we are dealing with patients. Are we consciously looking at our practices for instance, the unclean surroundings that Dr. Kaba showed in the morning, to me, they are a reflection of the individual, what the individual has come to see as normal. And that is probably a reflection of what is in their homes. So they are not able to see anything different. Otherwise, why wouldn't you want to make sure that things are better? I think that we need now to move from the stage where we are quoting data from outside to quoting Ghanaian statistics. It's about time. We should not be afraid of looking at ourselves and getting the data. Because if we don't keep looking at ourselves, we won't see the way to improving ourselves. And the reluctance to report, let alone document adverse events, for health professionals. Yes, to err is human, but you should be bold enough to say, I made a mistake. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we try and hide the mistake, you know, and hide the fact that something else has occurred. But now, the media, um, the age of media tyranny has also come in. 
Because the media misreports information. Some of the clips you showed, there was obvious misreporting. And they sensationalize, you know, and that doesn't help. But when it comes to standard operating procedures, it does not only have to happen within the clinical setting. Even in administration, even in governance, there have to be standard operating procedures because we are all creatures of habit. And what you keep doing the same way, you get better at doing if you are taught how to do it properly. So you can be held accountable when you have not done it. I think that um, there needs to be a balance between punishing mistakes and holding people accountable. Because if we are all looking at not punishing, we are therefore not holding people accountable. And the errors will still continue. And maybe self-audit should be on our curriculums, those of us who are uh, in the formative stage of uh, training people, both for the nursing training institutions as well as the doctors and the other health training institutions. So maybe you can just comment on that. And then for Kenny, thank you very much. I think Chinese alternative medicine has, you've had many years of developing quality. Because what we find is missing in the traditional alternative medicine in Ghana is the issue of standardization and quality. So I just wanted to ask, how many adverse events have occurred, even in your setting, with your many years of Chinese traditional medicine, and how many have been recorded in Taiwan? Thank you. In, in, in my department, you know, they, the, we, we just uh, lay the three methods in the treatment of patient. One is acupuncture. Acupuncture also have uh, some uh, side effect. The uh, most uh, side effect uh, is uh, just minor, just a uh, similar blue, and uh, just uh, you receive the uh, injection of uh, blood uh, collection. But uh, the some severe uh, side effect, se se uh, severe side effect, many pneumothorax, hemothorax, even the uh, internal injury. But uh, if you if you re receive the the, the uh, Strictive uh, training, and uh, you have a uh, good uh, uh, anatomy background. You can decrease the, the side effect uh, as possible. So, according to the traditional Chinese medicine, we can separate the acupuncture. Acupuncture, if you know the anatomy very well, and uh, you know you how manipulation, you can decrease the side effect. And uh, sometimes it's a uh, traditional Chinese medicine, the uh, herb. Because uh, now in Taiwan, we already, uh, we mostly use the uh, extracted uh, the ingredient. The, we make the uh, raw material and the uh, decoctive become the uh, liquid form and uh, use, uh, use a machine to dry the water and then become the powder form. Then powder form you can do the tablet and the capsule. And uh, we also can the, do the use the uh, HPLC to analyze the uh, in ingredient the component. Even you must avoid some the uh, have the uh, some toxic component. So they have uh, some uh, strict to control the quality of the uh, uh, Chinese herbal medicine. So uh, in Ghana, Manpong, Manpong they have the uh, uh, traditional traditional herbal center, right? Uh, I ever visited Manpong and uh, they just uh, use uh, one bottle of uh, liquid. Each, each, each time you just uh, drink one bottle, use uh, just a uh, transitional phone. So they want, to, they want to learn how to do the modern phone the product. And uh, I also uh, discussed with them because they need some device and uh, how to do that. And uh, because they use uh, this method, uh, you can uh, Decrease the uh, sometimes uh, the, the raw material. They have uh, some herbicide contamination, and uh, even they have a uh, heavy metal. You can do the uh, analysis. Yeah. So we have the uh, good crowd control in the traditional Chinese medicine in the our the national health insurance system to ask uh, the the factory you must uh, match the 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 G GDP, a uh, GMP.
good at many people factor. Mr. Ochi, would you like to respond to Dr. Nancy's comment? Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof, for those comments. I, the balance, I, I visited um, the largest hospital in the world, is in the, no, in Africa, in South Africa. It's over a 2,500 bed. They have a patient uh, complaint area, and they are a quality office. And in the quality office, part of their responsibility has to do with collating uh, adverse events and incidents across the entire facility. And then patients are able to walk over to, to them anytime they are not satisfied with any provision of care. This is in Africa. I don't want to go to the other parts of the world. I think that what they have, so in reporting, there are two systems of reporting. You can have mandatory reporting or the voluntary reporting. The mandatory is what is in the US. So that, I mean, that one, it is an offense not to report an adverse event. Because the culture is such that, I mean, they report it. In, most often in our health facilities, again, what we have is instead of that example, for instance, in South Africa, what we have in our health facilities are disciplinary committees. So the disciplinary committees have added responsibility of penalizing health workers whenever they commit medical mistakes or whenever adverse events occur. I mean, in such a scenario, no healthcare worker would own up. And even when the investigation, when we have finished the investigations, the investigations are punitive. So we look at who did it. The first question we are asking is who did it? Who was on duty? In such an instance, nobody would own up to a report. So these are a few. So, other, so I mean, I like the point Dr. Norte made about a, a, a cultural shift so that we would all gradually, because I mean, 99% of the times, the events or the incidents are nicely written in the folders. How many times would you read the full, except the courts are looking out for it. Even now, the patients are carrying the folders away. So I agree that there would have to be a balance, especially with respect to punishment and the accountability. But you see, it begins with the reporting, so that as health institutions in the country, and I mentioned FDA, they are trying with a voluntary reporting system, which is electronic. So anywhere you are in the part of the world, in the part of the country, whenever you identify any adverse drug event, you just go in and then you log, you log into the system. If you want to be anonymous, the system enables you to be anonymous. If you want your identity to be disclosed, the system also enables you uh, so that your identity is disclosed. So for the data we have in country that we can speak to, they are largely with respect to drugs, but the other uh, medical events and conditions you would largely get because of some of these uh, some of these issues and challenges. I mean, I speak to health workers all across, and when the incidents happen, they will never disclose because the first thing they are looking out for is punitive. So if a patient falls off from a bed, the bed doesn't have a side rail. On the ward, there were 30 patients on admission, and there are only two nurses on duty. And the patient has fallen off and you are going to punish the patient for a patient fall. I mean, yes. you are going to punish the nurse for a patient fall. I mean, how? No. Because it is more systemic than the healthcare worker. See, I sat in one morning meeting where one professor said, Hello, no doctor comes to the hospital carrying his or her stethoscope to come and kill a patient. That was very deep for me. So I believe that in as much as it is more systemic than holding, because uh, there are so many incident investigations that I have read, at the end of the day, the culprits are found. 
So the health workers are equally dealt with as far as their role in the event is concerned. But it is more especially systemic, and the system issues are addressed. But no, not, not in our settings. I, I have hardly seen such, incident, such e examples in our settings. Probably I'm too young. Uh, uh, I'm still growing up as far as my experiences in the setting is concerned. But this is what I have. We will take um, three, and then I'll entreat the speakers to be jotting them now three questions in a row, and then we allow them to respond, uh, please. Um, my name is Dr. Elena Baby. I'm a medical officer. Um, I want to comment on um, Elom's scenario, the first case he gave about his mother and the ultrasound scan. Um, my opinion, um, I don't think the actual act was wrong, but I think the process or it could have been done in a different way. And as you went on with your, um, on your slides, I realized you mentioned lack of communication as part of the causes of patient dissatisfaction. And I think that was the main problem. Because um, one lady asked the question about second opinion. And in the hospital as doctors, we know we are not all knowing. We all have different levels of experience and different areas of expertise. So in the person who first did the scan, asking other people to come and do the scan, I believe it was a step in the right direction, but it was done in the wrong way. The procedure should have been explained to your mother and should have been told, oh, I can't see what I'm trying to see, so I want to call a senior colleague. Sometimes in the hospital, I forget some doses of some drugs that I don't prescribe very often. And I tell my patient, oh, please give me a few minutes. Let me check. It sends a different idea than if I were just to pick my BNF and be looking through. Because my patient will go, ah, what's, what is this doctor about? She doesn't know what she's practicing. So I think that whole scenario was just a matter, was a matter of lack of communication, which we as doctors and as nurses, medical practitioners in general, we actually need to work on in order to improve our practice. Thank you. My name is Abdul Salam, uh, once again, a nurse from Kulebu. Uh, seen in your presentation that uh, if nurses actually take the leadership role, issues of patient safety and patient satisfaction will actually be achieved. I think it, it is true not only for patient safety, but for a lot of other things that has to do with health service delivery. In this regard, I would just want to pass a comment. Uh, with regard to this uh, probably program and other programs that we have, the inclusion of nurses into the presentation. It will be very good if we were to have a nurse to also be on the panel to present on patient safety, since majority of uh, the workforce in our hospitals has to do with nurses. Uh, generally, my concern in, in with regards to patient safety has to do with the system. Uh, we need to approach patient safety issues from a research point of view. If you go into our hospitals and our system, you realize that the problem is more of the system. It's the system. Sometimes you find yourself two nurses on a ward, you have about 30 patients. And very clear issue of patient for uh, pressure ulcer and stuff like that. It's not about the attitude and lack of willingness from the nurses, but it's the system. Many a times, nurses do a whole lot of things that are not related directly to the nursing job. Sometimes you need to screen a patient. Going to carry the screen alone, the amount of energy that you will exert, because the screen is so heavy, I don't know. So I think we need to look at it more systemic if we really want to make a very uh, effective impact. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Emilia Odofia. My discipline is community health. I have um, food for thought, and I think rather than directing it towards uh, Mr. H uh, Elom Ochi, I would leave it open to the house. I'm looking at the role of the media in Ghana. The general public has come to trust the media to be able to hold people accountable for their actions. And uh, like Professor Hesse pointed out earlier on, there's been a lot of misrepresentation of the issues. Is there room where we can 
find some collaboration between the media and the health industry, where we are allowed a time frame of at least 48 hours when reports reach them for us to investigate so that the message that goes out to the public is information that is appropriate, that is a true reflection of what happened, and more importantly, is a message that helps public Im improves health literacy in terms of what to expect from the service, and then also helps the institution itself. Because just like um, um, uh, Mr. Chi was pointing out earlier on, that the traditional tendency has been to hold somebody uh, to, uh, uh, to blame somebody for whatever happened, to blame an institution, to hold them in disrepute, to hold them in as much as we want to hold people accountable, we want to do so in a constructive manner that improves the system and strengthens the system. So I am looking at, can we find uh, a midway point between the media and ourselves where we can agree that when reports reach you, can you at least allow a 48-hour time frame in which both organizations can conduct their investigations independently, independently, but have a meeting point where they decide on what information is going out to the public? Um, the client is, I mean, that is why it is patient-centeredness. So Dr. Berwick says that what patient-centeredness is nothing about me without me making reference to the patient. So in the care of the patient, everybody, as far as a significant other is concerned, is involved. So you are discussed, we discuss all the risks and benefits, and when the unlikely happens, there is full disclosure from the medical team. So there is no cover up, so that whatever the patient so, and the, and the relatives are given options of the legal option or a compensation from the facility. So, the relatives have the right to exercise both. In settings where this has been implemented, you see that the curve of litigation goes down. So, I mean, the solution to that is pure transparency and being open to the patient as much as possible. But in most often, 99.9% .9 of our times in our settings, there is a cover-up. So, and even amongst the healthcare workers, there is so much denial amongst the team, even on duty. It is most especially because when the matron comes, or when the medical superintendent or medical director comes, he won't ask what happened. He will ask who was on duty. So that is the basic thing. So until we start rewinding and revising, the media would continue to carry out the fabrications of what the patient is telling them. And that is what will make us sit up as a healthcare institution. Otherwise, they don't have an alternative because we are very opaque and covering up whenever the events happen. Thank you very much. Yep. The last, uh, but the, not the least, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, Kenny to tell us more about, uh, by your experience about uh, integrated care, what's the difference between uh, interdisciplinary and uh, multidisciplinary cooperation, by your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, uh, I think that the multidiscipline, uh, you also have the, no, maybe you just uh, dis discuss in this uh, situation. For example, we have the uh, uh, in integrated conference. Maybe they have uh, some the different department, the staff in here, and we just uh, talk with the uh, with patient. Maybe in, uh, in other means, and uh, in patient, we have a consultation system. Consultation system, maybe you can have a, a different uh, department, and uh, you can get uh, some uh, uh, some uh, consultation information from the different department. But uh, the most important is uh, who organize the result. Maybe just uh, one doctor in charge for organization. 
But uh, the most important is uh, you must uh, talk with a uh, different factor. The communication between the uh, different department, I think, is uh, more important. So sometimes uh, we just uh, see the consultation result, and uh, maybe make a decision is uh, the in charge of physician make a decision. But if the in charge of physician have uh, some question, maybe he need to talk to the different doctor directly. It's uh, make it more clear. I think they the they, they the my, my experience. Maybe <laughs> Professor Lee have that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. The interdisciplinary cooperation like uh, merge together for the common goal and with the the same standard of operation. Multidisciplinary cooperation a little bit like a mosaic. They just work together, but maybe for their own goal or for their with their uh, standard of operation. So we 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 actually the integrated care we stress the importance of the interprofessional cooperation. Um, we've already gone five minutes into lunch, so we take the last three questions and uh, they will respond and then we can close this session. You, you should please, I mean, bear with us. Number one, number two, number three. I think that ends it. Board to present abstract and then present when it comes to issue of safety, but I didn't get any answer from that. And then my main question goes to Mr. Elom. Um, it's about um, policies, you know, like You've, you gave a nice presentation. Policies pertaining to education, because we have a lot of schools coming up, training, they, they claim they are training nurses and all those stuff. And Ghana Health Service post these train nurses to the remote areas, and then they are doing so many things. So I just want to ask, do you, your, your team, do you research into some of these policies to know the quality of personnel we send or we, we train up to, to give that quality of care? Because I, I, I strongly believe that the human resource too is a factor if we want to have better safety precautions in, in, in our facilities. The last person. It was some Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much to the presenters. Um, it's just a comment on Mr. Elam's uh, presentation. Uh, at one extreme is that tendency to want to blame people, and that's why most people will not report things that go on in their health system. And the other is want to, uh, that tendency to want to blame. So there is this school of thought about being in between, be, having the, the, the fair blame, not just the culture of no blame, because it's um, agreed that some actions are actually, they deserve to be blamed. While some actions are because of the system or because of some other things, some actions actually deserve to be blamed. So there is this incident decision tree which people actually use to make a decision as to what to do. Should this person be blamed or is just a system error? That person should be forgiven and trained. And of course, the ultimate is to put um, processes in place to ensure that those things don't recur. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Elam, and so we allow the speakers to comment and we'll be heading for lunch. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Yeah, I agree um, uh, to an extent with you. I mean, the, the, there has been an evolution. It's from no blame. Today we are talking about fair blame, and we move to a just culture, ensuring a just culture. So today it's about fair blame. So, I mean, and that is why when the events happen, and uh, until recently we were also talking about root cause analysis but today it is about systems analysis where the entire system is adequately assessed and analyzed whenever events happen so when they happen you know which part of the system to hold and to address including the human being who, who is part who is part of the system so i mean in all of this i am not so uh, another uh, level will also tell you we have the latent factors and then the active factors. Most often, whenever the events happen, you are seeing the cause at the front line. But there are so many underlying uh, circumstances that precipitated the, the event from occurring. As for um, policies and research, I was not so much interested in policy because I am not at the policy level, but obviously there is a lot of effect as far as policy is concerned. Because when you do the analysis again, 
policy will be a latent factor as far as its cause on adverse events or its replications on patient safety incidents are concerned. So I mean, as for research, it is undeniable. Uh, taking from where uh, Prof. Hesse mentioned that it is about time that we in Africa and especially Ghana get our own data so that when we are speaking, we are not relying on what the WHOs and the others are, are telling us. But are we ready to report? Are we ready to change that culture of blame? Uh, are we ready to change that culture of naming and shaming? Uh, because that is the beginning of getting accurate data so that something definite can be done as far as our patient safety outcomes in the country is concerned. Thank you very much. I would like to conclude the section now, and uh, Dr. Hesi, would you like to present?